a shooter there at Nobleville. I was coming, I stayed on the phone with her the whole time and just kept talking to her, kept telling her to stay calm, stay quiet until the police finally let her out. Police and paramedics responding to the scene within minutes. This very day, with day, with the suspect day, still on the loose. He's covered on the outside with the people there standing inside. 96 people. The teachers are students away from the scene. Fans in our country. As students find out outside, we'll just begin their search, having their feet to their backpacks on the ground. By 9 a.m. become a regular occurrence in our country and our very own communities for youth to become inundated in gun-related violence. Tragic acts of gun violence happen every year with death tolls skyrocketing to the tens of thousands. In this video, we'd like to shed light on the issues facing our country relating gun violence, school shootings, and how social media affect gun reform. How have you been affected by gun violence? I've been affected by gun violence when my cousin Richard Matthews got killed three years ago in 2015. I was 13 years old and it was just before my 8th grade graduation. I was devastated. He got killed outside of the club. He got shot several times and I was just on FaceTime with him the night before he got killed. Also, the police still haven't done anything about it. So what do you believe can be done to increase gun violence? First and foremost, um, I think we really have to give the community back to the people. I think we need to start, you know, other than laws, other than politics, we need to give these people the resources to take back their community, to build that network between one another. I think you have to look at the federal level, look at the state level, and the local level. Um, just from a Philadelphia and Pennsylvania perspective, you know, right now, I think the the requirement to buy handgun is 18. Well, the requirement to buy a long gun, that's how we define it in Pennsylvania, is 21. You know, I don't necessarily get into politics that much uh, anymore, but I kind of agree with our current city president, you know, really that I do, that we should at least raise the age of buying firearms to 21, all firearms. Um, but also, I think it's very important that we define uh, these firearms to the nth degree. I, before I became an officer, I constantly said Philadelphia Police Department is in the prime position to show the country how a police department should run. Years ago, when I signed the Police Advisory Commission, you know, we we understood. Hey, the department went to the Department of Justice and asked for recommendations. They didn't have to come to us. We went to them. Um, but with the training, I think the training has evolved over the years. You know, they always tell us. Years ago, it was um, it was that the officers would stay outside and just hold the area, you know, to make sure no one goes in if there was an active shooter. But now, since uh, with all the shootings that have been happening, you know, it's like no, no, we have to go in there, and I agree with that because that's the responsibility that we take as officers. You know, just coming from my own personal perspective. Uh, with our training, I think we have... How has school shootings affected you? School shootings have definitely affected me in terms of my perspective on school shootings. Before, whenever I've heard about school shootings on TV or wherever it was, I definitely thought it was a scary topic. But it's really different when you're experiencing one and you're being told to hide while there's a lockdown in your school. And it's definitely scary having the feeling of you not knowing what's happening or what's going to happen to you, not knowing who's going to come out alive or if anyone that you know might get killed during this incident. Thankfully, nothing really that major happened, but it's definitely a perspective change on my part and it's definitely made me see that this is a huge crisis in our country and it needs to be stopped. What happened? Basically, there was a shootout outside of my school. We shoot out uh, when it happened, it was, like I said, outside near the gym. And one of the people responsible tried to get inside of that building to hide. But the doors were all locked. And he was outside of the door with the weapon for a couple of minutes until the cops came and everything sort of died down. But um, there was a rumor that someone had ran into the school. So the school's on lockdown for two hours to see if that man had ran in. 
no one actually ran in, so it was actually a really good turnout. Since January 1st of 2018, there has been 20 school shootings in our country. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I always have concerns when we have shootings at schools, mainly because I worry about inner city schools having a shooting. What measures has the district taken to prevent school shootings? Okay, that's a good question. They have uh, increased their cameras in the schools. They reinforce uh, doors at certain schools where, where you have, they call them hot spots where doors are always violated. We have a tendency to, to change the deployment of the officers in the building or the NTAs or whoever the staff members is to keep an eye on these hot doors. Officers also go outside the schools and do perimeter checks throughout the day. Check to make sure that people are not jamming stuff in the door. And it, cause sometimes they look like they're closed and they're not. So the officers go out and do extra security checks and push the door to make sure the doors are secure. So we do those type of things. Everybody's supposed to be doing not just officers, but staff members do too. What is the protocol for school shootings and how are staff prepared? Okay. Are you referring to school shootings and a school? Mm -hmm. Okay. The administrations, school police, and all staff members are getting active shooter training. They have pamphlets here, and every school has charts in their schools that show you all different scenarios in your buildings and where you're supposed to go at, what you're supposed to do, and they actually do training on this. And this gets upgraded almost every year. Uh, the active shooter training is more with the principals in the school police department because they're the first responders to emergencies like that. How does the school district monitor social media to prevent gun-related violence? Okay. Um, they have the Philadelphia Police monitors the social media. Uh, we have a criminal intelligence unit here in this office up on the next floor who monitors their chatter on special social media. We also check as well. Usually what we do, uh, if there's officers at that location, they sometimes get a lot of information from the kids. Some of them have dummy accounts and they see stuff come up on social media and we use that as intel to try to keep things from happening. Social media feeds a fire that everybody sees it and then when you see gun violence on social media, they make it look like it's good, it's cool to do. It's good to be involved in that. And it just, it does glorify it. It's a shame that we're losing a lot of young people because of violence, of gun violence. But it, it, these kids get these guns and it feels like it empowers them. If they got a beef with somebody, they don't think about what, what's gonna happen to me if I get caught. And that's how they handle it. And then they out there fighting over drug territories. It gets ugly out there. So that would be my own advice, to share your experience with your friends so they can relate to what you've been through. I'm just there on the outside trying to help the best way I can because I didn't have to go through what y'all go through every day. Mm -hmm. And it's and I try to learn from y'all. That way when I talk to my son and my daughter, I'll be able to let them know. So as I'm on Instagram, I keep seeing, I'm scrolling, I keep seeing all these people post this one person. So I'm like, who is this? So I looked at the picture, but I couldn't really tell who it was because I couldn't really tell who it was because the like the picture was dark and his face you couldn't really see his face like that. So as I'm looking at, it, I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm thinking it's another one to be SoundCloud rapper or whatever. So then a minute later, that's when my sister called me. She was like, Ronnie died. Ronnie died. She crying and screaming. I'm like, who Rodney? She was like, Whoopi, Whoopi. Now Whoopi's first name, his real name is Rodney, but I called him by his nickname so long. His first name didn't click to me at, uh, so quick. So when she said, she's like, whoopie da, whoopie da. So I'm like, like I start breaking down crying. So then I go back on Instagram. And when I realized that it was him that everybody was posting, I started crying, breaking down even more. And it also hurted me even more because he died the day before my birthday. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time out to meet with us. We greatly appreciate your assistance. Can you tell us a little bit about this wonderful organization and what led you to start this business? Okay, um, 
The Amir Healing Center began because of the tragedy of my son's murder. He was murdered March 26, 1997. He was 20 years old. He was shot in the back seven times. Um, after his murder, <clears throat> I attended a program called the Grief Assistance Program that I can say saved my life. That program um, closed down and I had the idea to replicate it by starting the Amir Healing Center. Because murder, homicide is a devastating, horrific experience. It can destroy an entire family. So this is why we're here. To, there is no such thing as a good victim or a bad victim. There is a victim. And what I need to be made plain is that families are co-victims of homicide. They are victims too. We have support groups and in our, our support groups are unique in that they are individualized to particular groups. We have groups for adults, a group for children, and a group for teenagers and fathers and uncles and any male they bring. So we may have three to four groups run at the same time. We have people who volunteer and supply dinner, food. So from 6 to 6.30, we sit down together and eat, which is very important because people bond around eating. My son was murdered in uh, 97, and this was done in 98. Um, it was done in the city paper. This is a picture of my son's prom, and this is his morgue picture. You can pass this around if you want. Okay. Order. And uh, it was a whole article done about the murder. He was um, homicide 126 that year, and that year it was 400 homicides. Well, one thing I do know, um, there's no one solution. There's no silver bullet. Um, we need better gun laws. Our children need to learn about their history. I believe that because of the racism that black children experience in this country where they're told they're not worthy, they're not good enough, they're not smart enough, they have a low self-esteem. And when you don't love yourself, it's easy for you to look at the other person who looks like you and not care either. Because Nobody cares about you. And because of the access to guns, that's the weapon of choice now. Nobody's fighting, fist fighting. They're using guns because they can get them. He first opened fire with a shotgun in which he shot one of my other friends in the head and her body fell down not too far away from where I was under the table. That is when he turned like this and opened fire with the revolver. Today, Texas Governor Greg Abbott is hosting the first of several days of roundtable discussions to talk about ending school gun violence. 